Hey everybody, welcome to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Pro. This is the office hours for the winter and spring class. We are in office hour number eight on April 25th. As usual, we'll go through uh, the questions that are set out and then we will take a look at the upcoming assignments. Awesome, so we'll start with our first question here. Just going to share my screen. Everyone can see the question. Yes. Perfect. Um, my permaculture site for the course, my apologies. I had a number of sites I was working on, so I changed my site to the cabin that is along the river as it's more urgent. No problem. Issue to solve slope erosion approximately 100 feet long. 3.5 feet deep along the cabin site that runs along the brook. We're looking to redirect the current top ditch off to the side of the woods and put pipes underground to prevent erosion and let water run to the brook. As for filling the slope, wondering how we could apply hookah culture. It's a big area concerned about toxins from composting logs and such, any safe ratios. The first top of the slope, we hope to use that to get machines down to do some work also. Once the gap is filled in, we plan on planting trees that will help take up excess water and hold soil structure together, take care of planting trees with deep roots like willow. The cabins are on cement blocks, no basement, and septic is on the other side of the cabin. Nowhere near the site. Google slide links attached below for picks and base map. Okay, let's take a look at the picks and base map. So, So Ron, can you walk us through a little bit about what we're seeing here? I'm not totally making the connection. Absolutely. Sorry about the horrible mess of my slide. It's not uh, how I want it to be. But um, so on page 32, there you see that's the top slope, Tom, top view of the, the slope, the ditch. And then the second picture is the um, bottom of the ditch that runs off to the brook. Okay. And then... Page 33 is just a little FYI for the base map of the location. Um, so you'll see two triangles there. That's the cabin site. That's what we're looking at. And you see there is a directional water run and um, culverts. Sure, sure. And so the the erosion on that we're seeing in 32, where is it on 33? It is, um, you'll see um, there's two culverts there, this swiggly, scrolly um, icon. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll see there is water flow, um, directional blue icon that goes down to the, to the um, orange triangles. That's the cabin right. area. So you're trying to reduce erosion in this area. I'm trying to do erosion that's going down straight to the cabins. Um, so, so basically this area is what we're looking at. Is that right? Uh, down, down past the culverts, the two culverts that's at the top. So, so down right towards the cabin. So right here then? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. And so that. in terms of these photos, um, photo, uh, call, let's call it one. This is on this map looking which way? Uh, looking down, that's a top eyes view. Uh, so that's eyes kind of view. above the two culverts looking down towards the two orange triangles? That's right, correct. And then this is the reverse, it's at the cabins looking up? Exactly. Okay, and, it, and am I looking at an incised gully here where it's kind of, it's incised and the-, the Exactly. What's how do you what's the word for that? Gully, <laughs> an, to... an incised gully. Incised gully. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, okay. And so basically your question is how can you um how can you work with that erosion a bit more and potentially spread that water out a bit more? Is that right? Yeah, I redirect it um and that and fill up space in um one end of of, of Huda culture to see how we can do it without uh of course, without without poisoning the brook, because they're oh, we do it in stages or um, once 
that's filled in, um, we hope to be able to run machines down to, so that it's we can manage the, um, the cabin area from the other side, from that side, because it's, it's all a, a, sleep, a sleep, uh, steep slope. Yes. Yes. With trees and stuff, kind of hard to get machines and down to do any maintenance and, and work. And okay. also, of course, it would it would um, open open the area more for us to be able to walk off down to the down the cabin to the brook. Because right now it's like you have to jump hoops to to kind of access um, the rest of the land. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. I haven't seen much of your slide, so I'm just going to take a quick boo around. Or, yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So basically, what we have, um, I'm just going to pull out a little bit here because I think it's important that we go through and sort of decode the landscape first and foremost. I think that'll be useful for everybody if we can kind of see that conversation. So first and foremost, we've we've got a regular parcel size that um, has some really interesting topography. And so basically we've got a primary valley that comes through and then we've got two ridges on either side. And then on this third piece, um, We've got another minor valley or secondary valley, it looks like, and then we've got another ridge that comes out. So something to take note of for you, Saron, um, and you may want to skip ahead to the water assignment and read or watch the video, the water flows at right angle to contour, is that the water is not necessarily going to flow along your contour lines, but it's going to collect because it's flowing uh, perpendicular to these lines. So basically you have all this water that collects in a, I'll show you a little bit how, about how this looks. You were very, very close here, but um, so basically this is this is spot on. This is sort of what we're seeing, but basically this water is gonna flow at right angle to contour if your contours are correct. Okay. So basically yeah. what ends up happening is, and you can see it when you do it this way. And this is one of the reasons why I suggest yeah. that people play with this idea is that you really get to see how that water concentrates into that valley. And when we're in wet climates, which I think you are, Yes. What ends up happening is the valleys get wetter and that's why we have vegetation and the ridges get drier. So I say all of this to back up and go, most of what our work is in, in humid landscapes like this is to redistribute the water. So that way the water goes from the valleys back onto the ridges. And that's in essence, what we're talking about when we're looking at um, key line design. So key line design is an entire farm planning design conversation, but when we get into key line geometry right. and key line cultivation, the idea is, is that if we were to cultivate or to create any sort of earthworks, those earthworks would not be on contour like a swale would be, but instead would actually be off contour. So that means that it would start high in the valley and then it would move down slope so if we were starting here, we would be starting at 233, because that's what this contour is. And then it would end at 213. So hypothetically, if we were cultivating on this line, on this could be an earthwork, could be a terrace, could be whatever, um, all of a sudden there would be a reversal of water distribution. Instead of concentrating in the valley, we'd be concentrating that water onto the slope. So reason why I started there is that Part of what your strategy might be up top, if you're getting some concentrated runoff here, one is removing some of the volume pressure or the, the catchment pressure above and starting to work that way um, in a cultivation pattern above here. So something to the effect that allowed you to build a bit more water, um, uh, water cultivation off of this. So that might mean that these look like um, rows of trees. This may be uh, different elements that help you to build more, more water that moves away from and sort of dewaters this area. And that's really what we're talking about when we're having areas of high incised gullies is we're trying to dewater. We're trying to defund, if you will, um, mm -hmm. those incised gullies. Now, the problem with incised gullies is that what happens is that when when they they form and the way this starts is that you have the percussive effect of a raindrop that raindrop if it hits bare ground will break apart a soil pad into sand silt and clay and then if it gets into sheet flow now you'll get 
um, water flow that's moving over land and then it'll start to go into rills and these are these little you know sub centimeter um, little micro erosive channels then it'll go into runnels which are more concentrated and then you'll get an incised gully now the problem with an incised gully is once we get into that eros erosion potential is that it will completely and utterly unzip an entire landscape because that um, that incised gully here will basically continually come up and basically scour out the landscape. So what we're trying to do is slow spread and sink that water. And what I would do in this situation is I would probably start to work with something called um, probably some leaky weirs first and foremost. And so leaky weirs is a concept where we end up putting in um, logs and other other materials and other detritus across these areas and so we end up creating these little dams that are meant to be leaky okay and sometimes we need to anchor them in the sides either with rebar or other elements or anchor them with other trees so you know say we get something like this that comes across um and what ends up happening is in that channel we'll do a little cross section here i'll zoom down let me get a little bit more space. There we go. Um, what ends up happening is if, let's say, this is uh, a cross section of, well, how do I want to do this? Oh, I probably want to do this in 3D. Okay, so let's say that this is our channel. Right? So we've got this tree here, let's say, we'll put that in. We've got this multi-stem. So what we end up doing is, let's call this the base of the channel. So what we end up doing is we end up probably anchoring with a few rocks and then we end up putting in a couple of logs and we do this multiple times up the slope. And what ends up happening is over time, as we have material coming through, we end up with siltation behind here. So what this ends up looking like, um, we'll go back to cross section, my original idea here. So this is our incised valley and let's call this, um, oh, I should not mess up the two different languages here. So let's say this is the bottom and then this is the top and we have water flow that comes down what we end up doing is we end up creating these structures. So this is structure one. This is with our logs. And this is structure two. And this is with our logs. And so what happens is when water's coming down, it's bringing soil with it. So that water that's coming down here, it pools a little bit behind here and then it, it leaks through. Then it pools a little bit here and then it leaks through. And what happens is it'll bring soil with it and that soil will start to build up. And what you'll end up with is these little terraces that are built in this landscape. And eventually what you'll do is you'll, you'll fill this back in. But as I was talking about above this, what we want to do is we want to make sure that this water spreads out from the mm -hmm. top and doesn't come in here. So what that might look like, and if you want to... Um, yeah, hold up. <laughs> I'm gonna have I'm gonna have a full complete <laughs> thought before I have another one. Um, uh, what we end up doing here is we end up dewatering this upper, and we could start from the beginning of your 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 property and moving down. I just want to see what the triangle is. Natural spring. Oh, you've got a spring. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an amazing spring, but it's uh, yeah. Right. So part of that will be putting this into good function and making sure its overflow doesn't go down the valley. So yeah, I would we have, have it going through um, to our cistern right now. See the blue pipe. So that's going to our uh, going to our cistern. Um, that's just right below the first build, building. That's where the cabin area is. Ah, uh, gotcha. Cistern, mm -hmm. and then that water flows to our koi pond. Amazing. Um, so right now it's not being brilliantly captured in any way or form because it's just um, something that we're continuing to work on. Okay. So that water flows to the koi pond, refreshes everything, and then it goes to the brook. Okay. So it's there's there's no water capturing 
so you it's, know, it's not contributing. Gotcha. No, no, not right now. But the hope is we will do something with that. Yeah. So I could see something like a um, either a rolling dip or um, let me just bring up the erosion control guide. Let me take one second here. I've got a brand new computer. Not everything has um, has loaded. It just takes a moment to download. So there's a couple things we can do above here. Um, this is called the Erosion Control Field Guide. And the Erosion Control Field Guide was created by the Covera Coalition. Brilliant, amazing document that I think everyone should be well associated yes. with. Um, yes. And a little bit about what we were talking about, those one rock dams, things of that nature. But I think you're actually looking more at a leaky weir. Um, we're not worried about that. We're not worried about that. I don't know if it's actually in here. No. Okay. So instead, I'm going to stop that one. And then I'm actually going to bring up, we just had this amazing course called Low Tech Erosion Control with Neil Bertrando and Jeffrey um, Adams. And that course goes deeply into all of these conversations. Uh, let me just pull it up here because I think there's some great examples there that could help. And if you wanted to take some photos of above that slope and then land them on a um, on a, a base map, then we could kind of take a look at it. We could start to design some elements there. But okay. uh, in the interim, where is this? This is in where's LTech. Course images. Yeah, I think what I would do is I would, depending on what's above there, it looks like there's a building really close to where this starts off. Is that right? Um, the first one? Yeah, there's that's a sister in green greenhouse make do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so yeah, if there's if there's a few more photos from that area, then we can probably get a sense of, of what's going on. But basically what we want to do is we want to take the water away from there. And what we may want to do is, I'm having a hard time finding what I'm looking for. So I'm just going to go back here. And uh, it's totally fine if folks put in questions, you know, between yesterday and today, but the sooner you can put in questions, the better prepared I could be and I can have. Sorry. Oh, it's, it's all good. It's all good. It's just. Um, yeah, it gives you more time to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not yeah. At this moment. Um, yeah, we can talk more about it as we get to that land erosion part two. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can so what kind I of have some more is, things is, to think about. Yeah. What I might look at, there's a road here. Is that's right? This yellow? Yes, that's the main road. So what I might do is try and create some sort of uh, erosion control that goes across this landscape and probably comes down and out like this. You can see that it's cross contour. Similarly, I might do the same thing here and have it move down this way. So uh, without seeing photos up here, I can't, I can't say what that erosion control would be. But if you took photos, let's say from, uh, let's pull up, uh, one of these if you took photos let's say looking like this and looking like this and then coming okay. up like this and coming up like this allowing me to see this ground yeah um, i might be able to think a little bit more but basically with the i do have photos in um this slide here if you go up i think page 20 something there are photos of the entrances on it's kind of yeah um, unless you've got view quarters on yes. a base map i don't know where those are so yeah, we'll need that. This is an amazing site though. Look at this. It is. Yeah. We've got waterfalls on both um, ends of the river, a brook. Amazing. That's a, that's yeah. Great. I can't call it river because my neighbors, you know, you know, it's a brook and I keep saying river. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't offend the nomenclature of the neighbors. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I would do some kind of erosion control here that took this water and kind of took it out 
and probably allowed it to overdrain here. Um, so basically try to dewater this erosion channel. And I would do that all the way up. I would basically try to take that water and take it over and let it run out on this ridge or similarly let it run out this way. And it, it just all depends on what all these areas are. Um, and so I'd need to see images of that and, and general conversations. When we get to things like roads, we can do something called a rolling dip, which actually was in that control guide, which is basically oh, a very, um, uh, a very relaxed speed bump. And that speed bump, instead of being, you know, like what we'll see in, in um, industrialized planning, that speed bump is basically the length of the car. So that way it's very gentle. So it's, it's a very low and a very um, elongated uh, conversation there. I'll, I can actually pull that up because I'm pretty sure that's in the guide. Let me just take a look here. Rolling dip. No, it's not that guide either. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I would say from a concept perspective, we're trying to dewater this area. So that could look like swales. It could look like rolling dips. It could look like there's, there's a couple of ways of using rocks to actually direct water uh, away from an area. Mm -hmm. um, but basically this top area, I would dewater. So I would dewater this area up here. Uh, I'm just gonna bring this up here. I would dewater this area. And mm -hmm. then I would probably do leaky weirs down your brook. Mm -hmm. um, and then similarly, I would try and dissuade water from coming into that brook closer by, by again, creating probably some kind of earthworks off to the side here that basically promoted water to spread out a bit more instead of concentrate into your little uh, channelized and sized gully. Yeah, okay. We were thinking of um, part of the dewatering going down, going past the cabin area there. Mm. It, you can't see the top part of it. Um, it. You know where the two triangles are instead of going down, go up. Yeah. So we're, we're hoping to, we're thinking of putting, uh, creating a, a ditch up in the top here, there where the purple line is, yep. and then going down because there's a slope, it's not usable anyway. So we wouldn't, we didn't want to um, deep water to areas where we've been using. And that area is, is a slight slope, a con, steep contour. So we thought would be, it'd probably make sense to, to do um, the ditch up and then go down with a the pipe there, part of it. Yeah, I think without a more specific base uh -huh. map, and and I'd probably, if you wanted to go deeper into this, I'd probably make a base map that was uh, a call out of this area. So it's, you know, something yes. like this, where, yeah. or probably bigger, actually, I'd probably go from the top of your watershed, which is up here, and then all of this. Um, and then just getting a little bit more specific with all these elements and blowing this up and, and working with line weights so they don't crossover because this is a great base map for its size but as we start to punch in you can see that it's kind of hard to understand what we're right. looking at and that happens yes. um, but a base map like that i think would be useful wonderful <laughs> this this um just this base map was based on the old site is actually on, on based on the a-frame site that that goes um down more <laughs> wasn't even focused on that so but yeah that's my plan is to it's to zoom in on that those areas but it's good to know how how much um how big of an area in that area yeah yeah and if if your focus is really here for the rest of the course then um that's that's good um it's nice to have the idea of what's around us completely but then coming into that specific area then uh, just having that as a call out like it's good to have these types of maps where we know exactly what everything looks like but then yeah you know if this is the area you're going to focus on um then i think that's mm -hmm. pretty Yes. And can we talk about um, the trees to, to grow in terms of um, helping build a soil structure? Can you say more? Plant trees and things. Is your question what kind of trees to plant to grow soil? Yeah, yeah, to, to, um, to absorb the water. Um, we're staying away from birch because uh, the birch seems to 
um, great for taking up water, but it's, we have blight here okay. and they don't live for too long. So we're looking for more longevity um, trees that can live up for hundreds of years that, um, and we're not concerned with like, with um, it getting near the septic, <laughs> away from the septic area and, and the foundation of the house, there's no basement, it's on cement blocks. So it's not gonna, we hoped it's not going to um, cause any destruction. Right, okay. Um, have we talked about live staking at all? No, I don't remember that. Okay. Uh, just going to have a little quick nose blow. Excuse me. So there's a couple of things here. One is if you, if you're in a pretty steep slope, you can work with what's called live staking. And what live staking is, is uh, you're taking in, <coughs> let me pull up uh, David's work, uh, David Polster. There we go. So uh, David Polster is uh, one of one of the most incredible humans who started to understand that if we don't work with succession, then that successional conversation will be um, problematic. Uh, so we need to be able to bring about, um, we need to be able to successionally bring a site along its succession. So we should start with pioneers and we mm -hmm. should just go right to conifers. So what he did is he would take things like red ozer, dogwood, alder, willow, and other types of trees where you could cut a branch, dig a hole, stick it in the hole, uh, during a time when there would be enough rain and it would self-grow. And so these areas, which which might be of value to you, I'm going to stop share here and then can I share this? <clears throat> yes, I can. Can everybody see that? Yes. Cool. So this is done with red or dogwood and alder. And basically what he does is he takes um, live stakes. So he takes cuttings takes a piece of rebar, makes a hole in the soil, sticks this uh, piece down, does it throughout the entire landscape, and then takes live material and puts it behind. And what ends up happening is this completely uh, stabilizes the slope. So what this looks like, let's go back to our mouse. So this is, this is the same site almost four oh, years wow. later. So you can see the two trees there. So that site is completely pulled in. Similarly, when you're coming into these areas, you're working with live staking. Um, he's making it rough and loose. This is his retirement party. This is a good example. So there's that bird <laughs> nest. There's that bird nest again, bird's nest, bird's nest. And then the trees, that two season of growth is because he's working with pioneer species and bringing them in. This was um, a wild slope off of UBC down to Wreck Beach had completely eroded out. You can see that most of them are on, on lines there. <clears throat> There's that slope. We're, we're at about 70 degrees. And you can see what he's done here. He's putting in uprights, putting in that conversation, doing some what's called brush mats or pole drains. So some of these mats were used to create a water channel putting Blackberry at the top because kids were jumping over the fence and then boot skiing down. Hmm. And there we are. Nice. So that's, I forget what the timing of that was, but that conversation then comes up quite quickly. And there we are 1990, there we are 2019. It's completely reforested back in and it looked like this starting off. Wow. Kevin, can you repeat what that is? What's the warp and the weft of that? Yeah, so uh, it's called live staking. And sometimes you're serpentining, but mostly what you're doing is you're using these uprights as your arrestment. So they- An Upright is rebar or a plant or it's what? It's a plant, yeah. So he's using live stakes of red oz or dogwood, alder and willow. He's taking, you know, thumb size cuttings from- um, usually riparian areas. And then he's taking a piece of rebar. 
He's making a hole of that rebar, usually down half to a full meter, so two to three feet. And then he's taking that live stake, buds up, right? Trees still have to grow in their appropriate direction. He's putting it all the way down and he's having whatever extension above that he needs to have um, a place to put in those uh, those those back breaks, if you will, that are basically creating all of these little terraces, if you think about it, right? So, mm -hmm. So, so the the piece that's in the ground is the living live stake, and then both these are, both are. They're both. They're both. Yeah. So you've got you've got full, you've got full growth capacity, full vegetative capacity from both elements. So that way, you you're basically trying to get it from all angles. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Are so there I, more info? Sorry. Go ahead. We can, more info we can that I can. Uh, that we can um, dig deep into? Yeah. Book or... So if you're looking to David Polster's work, he's got um, a number of, uh, a number of, of, of public uh, uh, presentations online, but he also has a really great handbook that you can purchase from his wife. Um, that's amazing. So I'll, uh, I'll just take a look for it here. I know it was either in this this Q and A or in the last Q and A, I found it for folks. So if you give me two secs, I'll look for it for you. Thank you. So on the steeper sections, I would do something like that, Saron. Yes. Um, especially for those areas that just feel like, well, what the heck are we going to do here? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So OSU PDC. It's not you guys. It was the fall question doc. Let's see if Polster comes up. I knew I remembered this. Uh, more into depth, plant ID. Genevieve, there she is. Ah, uh, here we go. Great. So her name's uh, Genevieve, and you can email her directly. And I'll put this into the Q and A doc. Amazing. And I'll put it right below your question. So there's her email. And similar that's the cost and this is the, the living on the edge there we go and um unfortunately dave has been um diagnosed with alzheimer's and his family wasn't wasn't really thinking about the long term um of his work and what they would do and all the rest of it. So the great thing about the purchase of that manual is it completely helps them and his care. So it's a great, great thing to be involved in. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. If you want to put together a, a call or a, um, a detail map and give me a mm -hmm. few photos, we could start to design a little bit more. Wonderful. Thanks, Javin. Yeah, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. Great. So we have another question and it's about the, uh, it's about uh, assignment 17. I'm just going to pop to assignment 17 first. Plant system design. And our question, Danny. Could you please explain the slide friend food forest plant species matrix? Sure. And this is slide. Is this 113? Oh, there we go. 17, 114. Great. So 114, I'll pull up my screen share. Do, 
do, do, do, do, do. Oh, Jacqueline. Sorry, I just saw your your text. Um, David Polster is his name. And uh, that's all in the Q&A doc here. So um, I'll put his name here. David Polster. Thank you. All right. So um, <clears throat> with the plant system design, what we're doing is we're starting to create our very first design. And hopefully by this point, you realize that if it's taken us till um, slide 109 to finally start designing, it really is about long, thoughtful, protracted observation. So this first slide, we're getting a sense of the existing conditions, the goals, statement of purpose. So what are we doing with this element? Um, Again, if you want to use a horizontal title bar, you can. We just got this as a placeholder. Then we're showing the design itself. We're having callouts of the different elements. You can do it this way or other ways that have been shown. Uh, plant system cross section. So we're going to do a cross section across this design to show what does it look like? What are the different elements? And then we're, we're going to be putting in uh, a matrix. So what are the different plants? Um, what are their family? What's the type they are? Are they a shrub, a deciduous tree, a conifer tree, a ground cover? What is the USDA plant zone? Or if you're in a different part of the world, put in the plant zone that you're in and just change it. So if it's the Royal Horticultural Society or the European, Canadian, that's all good. Uh, mature plant size, make sure to note your units. So in feet or in meters, what is the minimum root depth? If you know it, if you don't, just say don't know or uh, can't find root pattern. The reason we're putting this in here is that um, the uh, natural capital plant database has a lot of this. So you can put this in. Is it a nitrogen fixer? What are its uses? What is its light and water needs? We've got a little bit of a uh, legend here that you can use. And what are some illustrative photos? So um, 114 is an example of that, of a different site that somebody had done. And we put it, we put it in here for folks to take a look at, just to show you what what it's supposed to look like. So 114 is the example of 113 um, filled out. And the in the side it says this is an example of a completed plant species matrix. Use it as reference and then delete it and or add it to your appendix before you submit your assignment. Does that answer your question? Yes. Oh okay. my God, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that I wasn't moving. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> No. I, I, I hope I didn't look too much noisy. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> no, it's there's so much information in the course and there's so many moving parts. It's hard to read everything. I totally get it. Um, no, the, 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 the worst is that I read it, but I didn't really understand what was that. And I was like, okay, maybe I ask him. But now that you read for me, I was like, okay, it made perfectly sense. Oh, but yeah, I read it and I, I didn't really understand. I was like, oh, is that something extra? But okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, and then the last couple of pieces, what are the interrelationships? So why are, why are some plants placed near other plants? Or how are they working together? Design facilitation, how will you maintain? This is one of the most important things and this is what most people get wrong. So here are some of the major things people get wrong when they're designing. One, they don't make space for maintenance. They don't, get, they don't have space for how to get into the plants and out of the plants and maintain the plants. So they'll, they'll do a design and please don't do this for the love of all that is holy, please do not do this. They'll do a design like this where they'll go, well, here's the, here's the key species. And then underneath, they'll have all of their support species. So let's say this is your apple and they've got all their support species and these are all the shrubs they've got underneath. And they've done something like this. I can tell you from experience, this is, this is everyone's nightmare because you can't get into this. You can't work with this. You can't, you can't come into it. Um, years ago, I, I worked with an incredible aesthetic designer and they really focused on the aesthetics of design and they taught me this rule of clumping. So clumping of threes and fives. And so we would clump with threes, we would clump small with fives, three, five, seven, nines. The way this works is just aesthetically, it creates these little areas and these little islands that if we put in the trunk of the tree here, so let's say this is our trunk, now all of a sudden we have the ability to move in and around this space, not to mention it, 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 it breaks up the monotony of the eye. So if you're coming in and through here, you know, you can access it this way, you can access it this way. There's lots of accessibility coming in and around this key species. And then 
remember that trees grow up and we want to have a uh, respect of what's called canopy and canopy size. So if we have another tree beside it, we want to make sure that these two trees have space in between them. We don't want them touching. So also give space between these two and this all gives us pathways. I, I have stock pathways of three feet or a meter only because that's usually the size of a wheelbarrow. More and more, I'm giving myself more space. I'm giving myself like four feet, a meter and a half. You'll never be unhappy by giving yourself more space. You will be unhappy if you give yourself less space. When we get to things like um, intensive vegetable gardening, you know, in between my 30 inch pathways, I'll leave myself, you know, six to eight inches, but I only need to walk down there every once in a while. So for that, it can be tight. It's fine. But once we get to perennial landscapes, you do want space to move around. You never want it to feel congested. So really think about that when you're getting into the design of this. Um, how is this designed to be watered on in installation and into the future? So really think about those things. Is this something that you're going to be putting in a passive watering, like a hugel, a swale, something like that, and you're going to be planting into that? Is this something that you're going to run irrigation out to? Knowing that in year one and year two, you're going to have to provide supplementary watering. And I can tell you, um, watering with a bucket, watering with a hose takes a lot of time. So just keep that in mind in terms of, of activity. Um, uh, we were so specific about this. We asked this question twice because folks were missing it. So it's both in design facilitation and here. So you can choose where it's going to go. And what are active or passive rainwater harvesting elements that you'll bring into this site? Um, while the design itself is important, I would say that these two elements, this one and this one, are probably even more important. Brad Lancaster talks about this. You plant the water first, then you plant the plants. Really think about that water management. And I'll say this once, I'll say this twice, I'll say this a thousand times. If you have a water harvesting structure, you need to show me where that water harvesting structure overflows to. If you have a rain barrel, if you have a swale, if you have a pond, if you have hugo cultures, not so much, but anything that's an active earthworks that will capture and hold water, you need to show me where that overflow will go. Because uh, that'll give us a sense of, of what's next and where that's coming from. Oh, you're welcome, Jacqueline. What if you're doing food forest, wild and natural? What do you mean, Saron? Um, what I mean is like, you just kind of scattered seeds or you plant things like, oh, well, let nature take care of it kind of approach, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can play with scatter. Um, the thing about a food forest is you're usually actively growing it for production, right? So you're growing it for produce and you want that produce and that produce has value to you. So I would say, you know, thoughtful observation and then placement is is important at a level of maintenance and operation and harvesting. You know, if, if you're on the side of a slope and you throw an apple, chances <laughs> are you're going to harvest the upper side of that tree where you can reach, but you're never going to get the downhill side of the fruit. So sure, there's there's a level of scattering seeds and just letting nature take its course. But think that if you do that, you're probably not going to be managing that to the extent to where you're going to get a lot of produce out of it or a lot of value out of it from a human caloric perspective or even fodder or dyes or, you know, the, the food forest concept is really about taking in fodder, pharmaceuticals, dyes, natural um, and animal needs and placing them. So if there's a section where you're like, we're just scattering seeds and we're going to let nature do its thing. Awesome. Chances are you're not going to get the same productivity if you had a managed food forest where you actively were being specific about where everything went. So just know that there's going to be a trade-off if you go the, the scattered approach as opposed to the, the specific intentional designed approach. Yeah. The reason being for that is like we have so much land and so much space that we're never going to get to it in like five years or 10 years. So we're not going to do anything much with it until we have a plan. So it's like kind of like you know, wishful thinking and just kind of like, oh, let it take its course because we're, never, we're not going to be working on it, on it or be in then, it in the way. Let, I would say yeah. let nature take its course. Don't worry about like, I manage 398 acres. How much of that do I see every year? I barely see it all in a year. I don't manage the rest of it. For the most part, it's, it's left. I don't have like, I'm one person. <laughs> I can barely, I can barely manage the food production system outside of my Bless house. Bless your Superman. <laughs> so 
the main thing is, is generally I leave the rest of the property to observe, to find, and it's amazing to find all of the species that actively want to grow here. And for the most part, I use it as inspiration and as my research laboratory to go out and go, I didn't know that was here. Interesting. Oh, and here's a bunch of babies. I'm going to, I'm going to dig up those babies and bring them down to my site. And oh, that's growing here. And every once in a while, I'll do a little bit of planting in gullies and valleys because we're very dry where I'm at. Um, and so I'll see if things will grow on their own. Problem is, is if I put them into the landscape, the deer get them. So mm -hmm. unless I do what's called chaperone plants, like plant a whole bunch of thorny thicket around it. But again, if I can get to it, a deer can get to it even easier and better. So generally I leave the rest of the property just for inspiration and uh, some, some larger um, uh, earthworks and, and elements and wild crafting and wild harvesting, looking at harvesting um, pine pollen from my site. So that's what that's left for. You know, it's left in a zone five, a zone four conversation. And I don't worry about managing it because as you were saying, yeah, it's covered. It's got four and a half billion years of R and D it's good. <laughs> so basically yeah. what I try to do is how can I reduce my needs on an industrial food system with every mile it transports has more destruction than even the agriculture, industrial agriculture I'm worried about, even the transport. How can I localize all my food so that way I'm not involved in that industrial food system, which if we're talking about effect that has a huge effect. If we talk about mm. nutrition or we're talking about the trillion member community that we feed every day, there's a trillion organisms within us, one tenth of which is human. The other ninth, the 90, uh, 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 nine tenths, the other 90% is other bacteria, fungi, all the rest of it. We're feeding that community every single day. And if we feed it industrial food that's coming, you know, on average, I think it's 1500 miles, 2200 kilometers away, if we, if we relocalize that and really put our efforts into, well, how can I grow the most amount of food, of food that wants to grow around me so that way I can do that, I guarantee you won't have time to spread seeds on the rest of your property. You'll be so focused on that in the first one to five years until you get perennial systems operating and get a good, a good process with annuals that you just won't have time for it. So my experience has been really focus upon the food around you focus upon producing as much food as you can in your area. So that way you become resilient and non-dependent on the industrial food system, which actively destroys uh, ecology around the world. And then when there's time, go for a walk in the rest of the property. When there's time, go learn from the rest of the property, set up trail cams, go and see uh, how nature is and how the ecology is when you're not there, go have a sit spot where you can go and sit and meditate Go have a place where you can allow the wind to blow through you and take your worries and your fears away from you and go be in that area as opposed to thinking with this human mind. I, I, I had a great mentor years ago and he had this, uh, th this is the downfall of not teaching this course actively because all of the lectures and the stories that I have behind me don't, don't get to come into it, but they're always there. Uh, we have this conversation, which is what's the loudest thing in the forest? Any guesses? The wind. Sure. Anybody else want to guess? <laughs> the leaves. Loudest thing in the forest is the human mind. Ah. What does it sound like? Hmm. Sounds so like can a trash I can ask you going down. About... Go... Sorry. Oh, sorry, I was going to ask you a question about these uh, food systems. Uh, because yeah, if you don't mind, I'll just I'll finish my point and then you can ask your question if that's okay. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, so he had this conversation. What's the loudest thing in the forest? The loudest thing in the forest is the human mind. What is the human What does the human mind sound like in the forest? It sounds like a trash can rolling down a suburban alleyway at three o'clock in the morning. So we go into these landscapes thinking we know best, force functioning things on them. And what we need to do is approach these landscapes from about two and a half, three feet tall, like a little toddler being like, what's going on here? What am I seeing? What am I experiencing? What am I looking at? So I say that because I completely hear you and I have that impulse inside of me when I come to a landscape, trying to design it all and, and manage it all and work it all and make sure it's all productive. But largely it doesn't need to be. So I would say, 
the part of you that wants to manage it, just give it a break. Like tell it it gets to take a small vacation and just really focus on the area around your house or your property and then move out from there. Have nucleated design, really dial it down, dial, dial down the erosion around the cabins, uh, work on that, work on that area, and then slowly spread out over time, if that makes sense. Very good. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're so welcome. That All was right. very refreshing to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and I could talk about that for a long time. So if we've got time, we can come back to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Jamin. Welcome. All right, uh, Diana, why don't you uh, go ahead with your question? Yes, now you started talking about that and that remind, reminded me that there is some mention about which farms you would prefer to buy on this, on this. And I was kind of thinking about that because I heard that argument before that actually buying from a supermarket can be better, even though it travels a long time, uh, the fruits and vegetables and stuff, it uses less energy than if I go and get a car and go to a farmer's market and buy like five tomatoes, you know? And then that person uh, had to drive it to sell those tomatoes for me instead of uh, just selling a bunch to the supermarket that's close to my house and I can just go walking and, and buy the tomatoes right there. So because in my situation, in my lifestyle, since I don't even drive, I don't even know which farm would uh, be something sustainable for me to go buy my groceries from a farm that would be very far from me. You know, with which I don't even know what I would have to do to get to a farm to tell the truth. Uh, and then if I just go to the supermarket, that's really close to my house. Mm. So what do you think about that for that question of the, the assignment? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think when we come to permaculture and we come to the conversation of this course, we have what's called the prime directive of permaculture, which is... Um, the 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 point is to take responsibility for yourself and for that of your children and to make that prime directive now was bill's original words and then he had take care of the earth take care of the people and um uh set limits to population and consumption and to take that surplus if you set limits and to redistribute it back into earth and back into people those were the original conversations um <clears throat> one of those things about taking responsibility for oneself is understanding and working with the highest level of food sovereignty and, and food security that we can. I think in this past couple of years, we've seen that um, a centralized industrial food system, while I think in, in some accounting, and I think your conversation about embodied energy or energy um, could probably eke out an individual person going to the farmer's market to buy five tomatoes. I would say that's probably a win in terms of embodied energy for the market, the, the supermarket. When we take a look at it from a global perspective and we take a look at the idea that we have largely centralized our food systems and the industrial food system on average is lower nutrition, um, it's lower quality food, and it generally comes with it a host of problems like virtual water where if fruits and vegetables are 90 to 95% water or actively dewatering a watershed by transporting them out, especially over years and decades, that also comes with that conversation. This is me just painting the picture. It's not coming down to what you should do. Um, each one of us has our own context and we need to understand our own context and what that means for us. I think probably for somebody who lives in an urban area and, uh, the local market, the local supermarket, the local grocery store, that may be the best way to, to work and to access your food. What I would propose is to really look at that and to say, is there a way to support something like a community supported agriculture box where these are ways to share the burden of a farmer, you're basically buying a future share in their harvest, that box of produce is brought to you on a weekly bi-weekly basis by the farmer to a centralized point and this is a direct to consumer model where instead of supporting a multi multi multinationals because of course a grocery store is a distribution system 
based upon distribution systems, based upon normally large scale agriculture. And the nice thing about, or the, the benefit of supporting local agriculture is that you're supporting individuals that are then there for times when not if that food supply is disrupted. And I think we saw that this past couple of years that it's only a matter of time when we're getting larger and larger disruptions in our food uh, system. I don't know if anybody's been reading the news, but somehow multiple food production plants have all burnt to the ground in the last three weeks. And as we take a look at global wheat prices, as we take a look at global um, fertilizer prices, fertilizer has jumped three times its price in the last 10 years. Hay has jumped, has doubled in the past two. We're getting to a place now where our food costs are anywhere between 25 to 45 percent of what they were three years ago. Um, this is one of the reasons why um, Kakisimo uh, Esquith and myself run a family food security program out of regenerative living dot online because the major thing that we have seen that is coming is a major interruption to our food supply, both in quality, cost, and quantity. And I want to make sure that people are at least starting to build the relationships with individuals around them to have either their primary food system move off of the grocery store and onto local folks. But that means not just buying five tomatoes from the, the farmer's market. It means buying the bulk of your produce from the farmer's market or direct to consumer or getting a bunch of people together and, and buying uh, if, if you, if you eat protein, be it animal or vegetable, buying seconds from a farmer, buying seconds of tomatoes and canning, buying seconds of fruit and preserving. It means going beyond being just a consumer within our food system and actively at least being a relation in relationship with individuals, because there's no relationship with the grocery store. And if not being an active producer, and that could be just preserving food. It, may, it might mean for folks that live in an urban setting and in a in a in a apartment or a condo, it means well maybe moving into actually preserving that food and storing that food in a centralized location. When I when I lived in an apartment, we had a group of folks, and one of them actually had a house, and so our food supply was actually at that person's house, and we would all come together. Uh, during the season, we would do major harvesting, major pro processing, and our food stores would be there. That produced that that required a lot of trust because <laughs> we we had to trust that person. But it also meant that we were moving along that food security, food sovereignty world to be more resilient. So, again, this isn't a condemnation or a judgment of you and your situation. But the world that I see right now, and it's one of the reasons why we've got a big audacious goal to reach 10,000 people to make them educated about food security and to increase the food security actively of 1,000 people by the end of 2022 is that I see our food access as being one of the, the largest dangers uh, of probably the next five years, if not the next 10. And I mean that both by supply by quality, by quantity, and by cost. If you take a look at places, and I think Syria is a great example. Um, Syria was a civil war that started as a water issue that then turned into a food issue. If we don't have access to water, we won't have access to food. And if we don't have access to food, there's going to be human conflict. And so all of that, I think for those of us in North America, we think that's a far-flung idea. We think that could never happen here. And by doing so, we insulate ourselves against the reality of what's coming. And I think permaculture is a great gateway drug for a lot of people to understand these concepts and to start to challenge a lot of our urban upbringing and our, our urbanization. But for you, I would say, you know, as much as possible, try to build relationships. And that's what that assignment is doing. It's basically asking you a question, which actually we just had in the family food security program, which was, What's your food shed? Where does your food come from? And where does that food come from? And is it localized to the place and the point to where you could actually uh, access your food? Right now, my food shed is, is almost my valley. Like my meat comes from this valley. My produce comes from my uh, garden. My staples are still coming uh, usually from local farms. But generally, I'm trying to localize as much as possible because 
again, it's a matter of, of when, not if we start to see more and more of these disruptions. And these disruptions are going to come in forms of, you know, further um, outbreaks from a viral or pathogenic load. It's going to come from um, war, right? The moment the, the moment the invasion of the Ukraine happened, we saw an incredible spike in wheat because that area is the breadbasket of the world. It has some of the most fertile soils, both Russia and the Ukraine. And the moment people come into conflict, they stop, wor be, they stop worrying about trade and they stop worrying about what they're selling and they just start to increase prices because what they have is all they have and they're not involved in, in production anymore. So all of that to say, you are right. Um, it is probably more energy efficient to go to the grocery store, get all your groceries than to go to the farmer's market and buy five tomatoes. But if you pull out a bit and go, how can I support a local economy and a local producers in a way that kind of takes away that, you know, could that box community supported agriculture or produce, could it come to me? Could it save me the trip to the grocery store? You know, are there benefits there? Could I start to grow more food? Because a lot of these farms that are doing CSAs, they usually invite or require some of your effort on their farm that's a way for you to actually get on on farm experience to learn how to grow more. So I, I would say that um, however you can do that, however you can increase your skills is a great way. That's how I started. Truthfully, I, I, I grew zero food um, 15 years ago. I had no interest in it. It was just, it was a pain, pain in the butt. Uh, I, I had grown up with the idea that, well, we've, we've, we've gotten to modern society to get away from growing our food when I realized that that was a bit of a trap and then I started to support TP Creep Farm. I don't know if they're still producing Northwest of Edmonton where I was living at the time. And it blew my mind because all this food I saw from the grocery store could actually be grown on, on, on a site in an area. And it was just so remarkable. And what was amazing about that was eight years later when I got into permaculture, the owners of the farm came to a introduction to permaculture course I taught. And I was, I was kind of flabbergasted because it was a bit of a full circle. They inspired me in part to go into this work and it had come full circle. So anyways, I would say again, yeah, I would say probably that energy trade-off would make sense, but I would just encourage you to take a look at that local food conversation a little bit more so and really start to push out and, and see what you can access and see what skills you can grow in terms of food security and food sovereignty. I appreciate it. I, I think a lot about this, actually, about food security. And my perspective is always from an urban environment, because that's all I know. And I, I wish there is a better answer. Hopefully, it will be in the future for Because a lot of people, just like me, live in a city, and they don't. A lot of people don't own a car, never will, uh, for many reasons. So I think it would be great few things to evolve for people who actually live in cities and a lot of times because they don't have any other option you know it's it's a luxury pretty much to have a land uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a uh, it's a, a, a great thing that many people will never have opportunity to have so how because a lot of people that live in the city they care they I care a lot I am a vegan pretty much because of the environment and because of the animals and everything else and I was like, but that's how I, I see that I can do for now, but I'm, I'm uh, hoping to expand for sure better ways because I am not that I know right now I have a farmer's market that I can go walk into my, from my house. I, I don't know of it, uh, but yeah, hopefully in the future, people can start to think of ways, uh, everybody uh, to, to uh, give access to these things also for people who live in the city for sure. Yeah. And, and as I was saying, I think things like community supported agriculture, getting together with friends, building your food security and sovereignty. I think those are great ways to do it. And um, I would just encourage you to reach out and to start to see if there's opportunities. So thanks so much. Jacqueline has a point here in tropical areas. I see we have to change our diet big time. We're so used to annual crops that we can't grow well here. We have so much growth of other types of trees. The problem is that we lost the knowledge of how to use these plants and less knowledge we have on endemic plants. Introduced plants from other tropical areas are also great here. Jackfruit seeds could be eaten and it's great carbs, but it's not frequented. Uh, it is like people want to see if see it in the supermarket to know it's edible. Yeah. So Jacqueline, this was um, 
I think the situation in Cuba is a great conversation during the special period during the 90s when they were cut off from all of their uh, processed food imports from uh, the Soviet Union and how they had to readopt uh, so much of their agricultural practices, but they kind of skipped over the idea of perennial trees and perennial fruits. Um, once you get into the subtropics and the tropics, um, it's just amazing the amount of vegetable, uh, the amount of fruits and the amount of leaves that actively grow in the tropics and the subtropics. This was something that I was astounded by um, with different permaculture sites in Cuba and Kenya and Uganda and uh, I think the other thing that's not very common in tropical situations because there's so much food is preservation. It was something that the Cubans were really jumping into and are still very uh, um, rare. They're very unique. They're um, kind of laughed at sometimes in that circle because people are like, it's the tropics, things are growing all the time. But when you start to take a look at disruptions and there's there's always disruptions, be it hurricanes or I've been, I've been educating myself about Mexico as of late and it's incredible to see the seismic areas in the Southwest and to see the hurricane region in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and just, just the incredible range of, of growing zones in Mexico. It's just phenomenal, but the amount of food you can grow in Mexico is ridiculous. It's just amazing. Taking a look at um, the area around Veracruz and um uh, Cordoba and uh, all, all of these places where the majority of the fruits and veg come within, you know, a, a 25 to 50 kilometer area. It's one of the most resilient places I've found. It's just remarkable. Um, and even where you are, it's, you know, the, those are areas where your annuals are not going to grow as well because it's not suited. And it's this idea that, well, annuals can grow ed everywhere. And it's it's not exactly true. All All vegetables, all plants have what's called uh, a fam or a, an area of origin. So when we take a look at apples, apples are from Kazakhstan. When we take a look at, um, you know, there's in North America, I think we only have a handful. I think there's about seven or eight of the foods we actively eat are native to here. And we always think, well, we can grow everything everywhere, but it really pushes us to think, well, what actually grows here and what can we, what, what can we work with that wants to grow here? So I so appreciate that point of view. It's, it's an important one. Did you want to add anything to that, Jacqueline? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I was just, um, I really think it's interesting what I found out, especially here, like the way I think uh, the Spanish people came and we just had like a, a mix. Uh, we kind of like lost what we used to know on food systems. Um, and that's kind of like something I've been struggling into getting the information about. For example, there is a plant, uh, the capomo, which is called like Mayan nut. And there are movements of people going again to Mayan communities and teaching them like how to prepare the seeds so they can add it back into their um, like normal food, uh, like daily base thing. Because it got already like super lost. There's another uh, plant that's called Mayan spinach because of the area where it grows to. And it's also not being eaten by people. So it's kind of like, I don't know if you have any suggestion or like any uh, place where you would think it would be good to search this type of stuff because I've been struggling with getting like this type of, of information. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I, 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 know, I know of a number of places outside of Mexico, but I'm going to put that as one of my side projects this week is to start to take a look at um, indigenous and lost plants. I found an amazing book that might be useful for you. Um, mm -hmm. It's 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 tropical plants, but it's for Kenya, so it's it's not going to okay. be specific to you. But I will reach out to a number of my colleagues in and around the the area in Mexico and and see what they have and uh, whatever I find, mm -hmm. I'll I'll pass back on to you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting. It's really so so interesting how much food we can grow and like how we can really not depend on any other thing. You know, like carbs wise, we can just like grow on the fruits, just harvest them green. Um, it's just like so starchy, like it's very amazing. But it, yeah, it's just like this part of like it, it's so like the information is so lost, mm -hmm. um, or it's difficult to find. Let's say like that, it's difficult to reach to it. Um, so yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and what I'll say is this, is that if if this is of interest to you, this might be a place for you to, to start to, to make waves within the permaculture indigenous plant community within Mexico is to start to research, to start to gather either an online resource or to start to share that information or to host that information. This is one of the things that yes. I found um, when I came out of my PDC in 2009, uh, I, 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 I was really upset that there was some kind of weird idea that a course could be monocropped by taught by one person. There was something about the way that permaculture was being taught to me that kind of went against what permaculture was. It was like, how does one person know it all? That kind of seems weird. So my approach was, well, let's pull together the best people on Vancouver Island and let's offer a multi-person PDC where I and a colleague of mine are holding the reins, but we're having the person who knows gray water the best coming in and the person who who knows native plants to come in and that then turned into creating a repository of information that we then used for the island so we had an incredible database of information knowledge and all the rest of it so sometimes when we go throughout these courses and when we're doing sort of the SWOT analysis of what we can find and what we can't find in our area uh -huh. for you it's Mexico we actually find a place for us to start to make waves or start to become a lightning rod for that. So I would encourage you if you're interested to start to connect with that. And um, yeah, maybe maybe we can start to share information together and start to pool some of that information. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Awesome. And uh, Adria's got a great point here. I found a wealth mm -hmm. of historical ethnobotanical research through JSTOR. There's a lot of open access content and you can access up to hundred articles by signing up for a free account. Great place there, awesome. Okay, well, folks, we're we're definitely over time, but I'm glad we took um, a little bit of time to explore the conversations today. And thanks so much for showing up and your questions. I so appreciate them. And uh, yeah, we're we're stepping into some of the final assignments, so getting into the design and design conversations. Feel free to to put together the assignment. And if it's not perfect, you can still submit it. And the great thing about this is the feedback, so I can give you feedback on these designs. Remember that all your assignments are due on our final due date. So they all need to be in by that date if you want them um, marked. So we are coming close to that final due date. So it's important to keep that in mind as we get close. I'm just gonna pull up um, our page just so I can make sure that that's uh, spoken aloud. So yeah, so we've got May 30th, all of our assignments are due. And then from there, um, we'll, uh, we'll have our final conversation and off into the world. So thanks so much again. It was such a pleasure talking with you all and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks time. Thanks folks, bye. Thank you, Chavin. You're welcome. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. You too, bye now.